welcome today. My name is Marian Larsen. I'm uh, the director of innovation at Innovation Skåne. And I'm also, together with my colleagues here, Frida and Michaela, running an accelerator in the new business Connected Health for all of the Nordics. So we cooperate with Oslo MedTech, Sahlgrenska Science Park, uh, Stockholm Science City, H2, Olo Business Center, uh, Helsinki Vertical Accelerator, and a lot of others. Smile Incubator in Lund, uh, Kobiz and, and Copenhagen Capacity in Copenhagen, and Delta in Copenhagen, and others. All trying to support connected health startups to take the world. And our goal is to take at least 1% of the market, meaning 10,000 new jobs. And why not 5% of the market? Because we have the assets and we have the entrepreneurs if we join forces. That was a short one on why I'm here, and I'm so happy to see you. And this today, we're going to talk a little about uh, Health 2.0. So we launched the Nordic startups at Health 2.0. How many of you know what Health 2.0 is? Have you ever been to a chapter? Yeah, you have. <laughs> so some of the startups that are here today was at Health 2.0 in Silicon Valley two weeks ago. That is the international, that's where it started. And it's got chapters all over. There are numerous organizations today focusing on connected health, e-health, digital health, and the such. This is one of the oldest ones, and, and it started in Silicon Valley. It's now 10 years old, and they're talking about the future, and they try to gather all the competence in the area to see what is going on. And we will, a few of us, we probably have totally different perspectives on what we learned there. But we were at least 30 startups there, including the Finnish ones. We had one Nordic and one Finnish track. And in my impression, we really showed off. We did. You agree? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to start with a movie that I saw on one of the breakout sessions. I don't know if any of you saw it. One shot, one opportunity to unbreak healthcare in this moment. Would you capture it or just let it slip? Yo. Her palms are sweaty, gloves tight, arms unsteady. There's vomit on the scrubs already, room for spaghetti. She's nervous, and so the nurses, they look on with pity. She won't stop, student loan default ain't pretty. So she clicks on, her inbox grows so loud. She opens the chart, but the labs won't be found. She's choking now, while the patient's holding out to connect. But how? Time's up, over, blow! Age caps is reality, ho! Oh, the breast gain, he means those depressed ladies get hosed with those Valium. Holding hands with them, no code. For that meaning, she don't get jack paperwork stacked and stacked on her heart broke. She's so sad, system broken so bad that she knows when she thinks back to that. Oh, she took that's when it's back to the goal again, yo. She ain't selling a soul. Time to wake up and I'm breaking, yo. Don't ever lose yourself in the system. The more you wish, and you shouldn't go to business school. You only get one shot. Do not let them crush your soul. You should be proud to be working that Ivy Bowl. Between being the doctor and a decent 
and father that Obama drama bleeding on and too much for us to want to stay in this spot. Our scalpel's friend is not together with the patience this entire team has got to formulate a plot for a whole economy shot. Success is our only therapeutic option. Failure's not gasping for breath, so our inhalers got the flow. No, we will not hold, we won't be stopped. How 3.0 is our shot? Hospitals, nurses, and docs is maybe the only opportunity we got. Don't ever lose yourself in the system. The moment you want. Set our minds to Doc. This was uh, a very funny guy who's actually launched Hell. 3.0, that's what he calls um, Unbreak Healthcare. And this is, to me, shows how the Americans see... Oh, sorry. You want to see this? <laughs> um, I think this, this is very much... I'll have to shut it up. This is very much uh, the impression that I got. Very much is focused on on the healthcare system. We'll talk more about that later. Now, you're, this is Michael Gustafsson from Learning to Sleep. He's prepared some, some, um, your, your trend analysis, I guess. Now, Learning to Sleep was one of the startups that exhibited from the Nordics. You're from here, you sit in this building, Michael? Okay, so, thank you, Mariam. Oh yeah, this is for the camera, I don't know. So, hi everybody, I'm Michael, and um, Mariam asked me last week if I could uh, do some, uh, my perspective on trend analysis. Um, from health 2.0 and I will do that kind of. Uh, uh, before I start I will just tell you what we do. Uh, we are a small startup sitting up here uh, called Learning to Sleep. We do uh, cognitive behavioral therapy distributed through mobile phones for people with sleeping disorder. So uh, simply we helped people to uh, solve their sleeping problems through a mobile application. And for you who have an iPhone, you can download it from App Store. It's totally free. And uh, I promise you, it will help you to fall asleep faster tonight or get better sleep in, in the long run. That's a goal. But um, I will not talk about that. I will actually talk about uh, the trends that I saw at Health 2.0 but from a startup perspective, because, uh, you know, you can just Google Trends Health 2.0 and you will find all those buzzwords that, that, uh, that are around. So I will kind of give just my perspective in a couple of slides on what happened uh, in the US and uh, what I think will happen in the future. So um, it will not be a lot about uh, those cool techie trends that uh, everybody is looking at, more uh, a startup perspective on what's happening right now. And uh, the first reflection I had after being at the conference, talking to all those people that I met in the US and also uh, with investors and uh, a lot of other people that I know, friends I have in the US, is that the trend is quite clear now that consumers are taking back power over healthcare. And I think personally that's a great thing because we are in the middle of democratizing healthcare that we have been talking about for many, 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 many years. And now it's happening. And I have this graph to kind of explain how what I mean with taking back power. So 
if you if we just look at how the healthcare market has evolved from let's say the 40s or 60s we can see that okay back in the 50s if somebody had a bad stomach they will typically go to the physician and the physician will will tell will ask them some questions do a diagnose and write them some pills or or whatever uh, and people actually trusted the physician right and then in the 70s and 80s we got influenced by alternative medicine, especially in the US. So all these yoga classes and uh, well-being things, uh, alternative Chinese and Japanese medicine. I'm not saying now that that is a bad thing. I think it's a very, it's a very good thing. Uh, we need alternatives, but that is what happened in uh, on the consumer market, still in real life, right? Then came digitalization and internet was available for everybody from the 90s and so on. If, and if we look at especially the US, what we could see was that those companies that were working with alternative medicine and those people who were working with mindfulness and well-being, they were very fast to adopt this new technology. If you go back and look at web pages from the, the 90s, you can see there were a lot of web pages for alternative medicine and there was nothing from traditional healthcare. And the consumers were quite fast in adopting this new technology in relation to alternative medicine, and nobody really asks for evidence. People just bought things on the net, hoping that it would fix them, right? What is happening now is that the consumers are moving up here, demanding evidence-based do-it-yourself healthcare distributed through digital channels. So, what we are seeing now is only the beginning of the change of, of healthcare. Even though many people said that, oh, but now we're going into health 3.0 and 4.0 and so on and so on. Maybe we are, we can just, it's just a new, new word, right? But what is happening now is that we are democratizing healthcare for real. That, that is the first thing, that, that was my clear reflection. We've been talking about this for a long time, but when you talk to investors in the US now, since we do that, do that a lot, you can also see that we have gone from very huge investments in business to business over to very huge investments in business to consumers. And if you just track and follow the investors, you see that they also follow this trend. So, so, so that, that was one reflection I had. Another reflection was, of course, that everybody here that are in digital health are talking all the time of, the, of disruptive. We are going to disrupt the system. And disruptive today is a good word for most people. But not for everybody, of course. Disruptive is not that good for Ford Motor Company as it is for Tesla, because Tesla are the ones that are disrupting the automotive industry. And the same thing goes for healthcare. And you could very, very clearly see that at Health 2.0, two things happening that shows that not everybody is super, super happy with digitalization of healthcare. And one of those groups, or actually I was listening to one of these fireside chats that they have in the US, they love that word. And of course there are never any fires or uh, anything, it's just people sitting in chairs talking. And um, it was the guy who was, I think he was president or chairman or something for AMA, the American, American Medical Association, which of course are all the physicians. And he called digital health the new snake oil. And you could wonder why. Well, of course, what happened? And I actually took one of the old models that I learned in school. Everybody who has studied social science or something like that has seen this fantastic model invented by Levitt back in the 60s. And what Levitt said then was that if you change something in one of these boxes, everything else will change, right? So what are we doing now with healthcare? Well, we are changing technology, right? And what happens when we change technology and 
increases availability of healthcare and healthcare information to more and more people, well, we will affect the people in the healthcare system, we will affect the organizations, and we will also affect their daily work tasks. And all changes here threatens the power structure in the healthcare system. You must remember that the, the power structure in the healthcare system has been the same since the 18th or 17th century, right? You have the physicians, they know everything, and then you have some other people and they don't know that much as physicians. And what is happening now is actually that you have patients and co-workers that know knows as much as the physicians. And for some people that is a problem. And that is also why the traditional healthcare system are so slow in adapting new technologies that really changes the healthcare system. Not new technologies that will find a tumor faster or a, a discover, do blood analysis faster, but new technologies that actually makes the healthcare system more efficient and distributes power to more people. So we are in the middle of a power structure and it was really, really obvious when you are in the US, you can, you can really see, see that the physicians organizations, some of them are actually fighting more or less against digital health. That's really interesting. The other thing is this thing. In Sweden, we love doing pilots. So when you talk to investors in the US, you say, oh, we did a pilot with Region Skåne. Pilots, it's a bad thing. They don't like pilots in the US. Why? Because it has become more and more of a strategy from the other, one of the other power centers in the healthcare system, the big pharma companies. Easiest way to destroy a startup is if you are a big pharma company, you go to the startup and say, you know what, we want to do a pilot with you. Normally, the startup says, oh, hey, we got the collaboration with a big pharma company. They are multinational. They have loads of money. And you go to your investors, and the investors say, hey, yay, you got the pilot with a big pharma company. That's great. The thing that happens is that you do a pilot, and then you do another pilot, and then you do another pilot. And then after three years and 10 pilots, you are bankrupt, and you close down your startup. Oh, sorry. So. Pilots are not always the solution for startups. I'm talking about from a startup perspective now. You must remember that. We are not scientists or researchers. We are startup people. We want to grow our company. Pilots are not always the best way forward for a startup. Investors in the US are super clear on that at the moment. That's my other reflection. Of course, no, no, normally I, I can give you a con concrete example. One of the very big pharma companies contacted us uh, earlier this year and we had a collaboration with them and then they came during the summer and said, oh, you are such great guys and you do such great work. We want to do a research study with you. Uh, uh, and then I had learned a lesson from um, history. So I said, yes, we can do that. Just give us uh, 150,000 US dollars and we will do it uh, for sure. <laughs> I said, ah, uh, we thought you could do that for free. I said, ah, we have stopped working for free. Uh, the problem is that 99 out of 100 startups will say, yeah, yeah, let's do it for free because it looks so great on our webpage, having that fantastic, great brand on the webpage, right? So, so, so. <laughs> I'm not saying, since this is being filmed, that it's a strategy from big pharma companies to do that, but uh, if you look at the statistics in the US, you can see that there are a lot of big pharma companies that do this all the time, and they never pay. So my best advice to, to those of you who have startups here or who are advisors for startups is that if the big pharma companies approaches you, that's great, then you should say, okay, let's pay us 
because we're doing some research for you. Um, another reflection is that uh, <sighs> we work with sleep. And there were a lot of companies um, at the conference talking about sleep. Most of them have some sort of gadgets. So connectivity is one of these key trends, and you will hear it 10,000 times probably this week. But connectivity is a key word for those, also those who are doing only software. So you need to find a way to connect to all these devices that we are now, now putting up. That's also a shortcut into, I think, the traditional healthcare system, because the traditional healthcare systems, they tend to love different types of gadgets and devices. So, to uh, finish this off, um, just some good to say buzzwords if you run a startup and if you look at the trends now. Um, paid proof of concept. That's the word the investors love nowadays. Forget about pilots. Everything is about paid proof of concept. That's the best thing to do. Connectivity, I said it before. Big data, everybody is talking about big data. Uh, one disclaimer around that, I would say when you are in Europe, but also in the US, that is that for those of you who don't know what GDPR is, uh, you can ask Steen up there because she's more or less an expert nowadays. Uh, no, you should figure that out because uh, Everybody is talking about big data and how we could use big data. On the other side, the back side of big data is that we are giving away a lot of our integrity, right? So next time you buy a Google phone, think a bit about all the data that they are gathering about you in their databases because they sell data. They don't sell hardware. They, they sell data, right? And that, the same thing goes for healthcare. And now Europe is starting to regulate this. So everybody who was thinking of building their startup around the business idea to sell big data, I think you should rethink. Because you will not have that availability and those possibilities to sell that data in the future that you think you have now. And of course, artificial intelligence. Uh, everybody's talking about it. Uh, it's not only about IBM Watson. There are a lot of systems now that are more or less white label possibilities to do your build, do and build your own um, AI systems. And uh, I think there are great possibilities with, within that. We will see that probably explode in a couple of years. So, thank you. That's all. So please stay. Um, so, how do you how do you perceive the difference between uh, the Nordic startups and the startups in in uh, Silicon Valley, for instance, or the ones that you saw? I would say that uh, I think that Nordic startups actually compete very well uh, with those startups that I at least those I saw at at the conference and those I know of in the U.S. The big difference is, of course, that. The, is of course funding. Um, I just saw that investments investments in digital health has never been as big in the U.S. as they were in the last quarter. So, so uh, we have something to work with here. A typical digital health startup in in Sweden might get one million Swedish. Let's say that that to just yes, to be nice. Um, uh, as some sort of uh, starting money, a typical U.S. startup will probably get one million dollars for doing more or less the same thing. So, so uh, funding is absolutely a disadvantage that, that we have here. But technology-wise and content-wise and business idea-wise, I would say that we could definitely compete with the U.S. startups, at least the ones that I, I saw in uh, the U.S. Now, you happen to be there on an accelerator, which you were picked for uh, in June. It was uh, Johnson & Johnson, together with Plug & Play, launched an accelerator for Connected Health. 
eHealth, mHealth. And they picked you. Out of the thousand that actually applied, they didn't. They were picked to join that ac accelerator. So you spend some time there. Uh, now you are on the consumer side, you're on the mental health side, which is quite a crowded space, I guess, in Silicon Valley. So how come they picked you? Oh, very good question. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, actually, I don't know. I think we, ha we have been, we are trying to focus very much now on sleep and treatment of sleep through cognitive behavioral therapy and changing behavior. And if you look at the space, mental health connected to sleep, 90% of those that we are competing with are doing gadgets or software in order to help people to fall asleep. And we are not doing that. We are trying to change people's behavior and giving people tools in order to get a better life. So we are focusing, and we are not only focusing on the night, we are also focusing actually on the day. So what you are doing now will actually affect your sleep that you will have tonight, right? So be, be careful, Maya. I think that, but, but I, I have no really good answer on that question now. Well, you talked about evidence-based. Could that be a difference? <laughs> it can. It can be a difference, but I would say that it it more and more becomes like a hygiene factor that, I mean, most of the companies that I meet in the U.S. actually have evidence uh, or are based on something that is, uh, that has some sort of research val validation. At least when, when you talk about software companies that we are competing with in the space of sleep. But... Of, but then I met all these strange gadget companies that were also doing, doing sleep things, and they were not evidence-based at all. So I, I think the market is quite divided. There are a lot of stuff that is sold right now that nobody really knows if, the, if it works or not. And then there are a lot of also evidence-based. But I mean, we are looking at those companies that are evidence-based. And of course, uh, you need to be humble. There are a lot of evidence-based companies in the US as well. I, I wouldn't say that we differ differ that, that much. But but I, I think we have a very good system in Sweden or in the Nordics for uh, creating evidence-based um, companies because we have quite easy access to research from uni universities. Uh, if you want to get research from universities in, in the US, you actually either you need to pay for it or you need to find a researcher to start your company with. In here it's easier. You can just find find things on on, on the net that are available for everybody. And and that's a good thing I think. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Um, my name is Olga and I, I am a researcher in life science and now I'm studying app development in Mamme. So I'm thinking a lot of those kind of applications uh, in health. And uh, my question to you is, uh, if you have this great idea and it's on the market, how can you compete with others who can actually just go there and take your idea and maybe uh, package it some other way and sell it from a bigger company directly to, let's say, doctors and hospitals? <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. Um, um, okay. For, first of all, I mean, in the app world, there are more or less nothing that you. I mean, normally you can't patent things, or so IP protection is quite difficult. Uh, for us, it's all about putting our products in in a context. So we are trying to build relations with those brands that are uh, complementary to us, like uh, fitness bands or uh, other stuff that I don't want to talk about right now, because that's kind of our business secrets. <laughs> yeah. Can I also suggest you talk to Michaela? And we could talk a lot about business development and support and bounce ideas with you. Um, any other questions to Michael right now? You can keep on asking later. 
None. Okay, so this is, now Michael represents consumer products, an app for consumers in Silicon Valley, where the consumer products, in my impression, has been what has taken off is wellness and now mental health is taking off. And they actually compete fairly well in Silicon Valley. The other part that I saw a lot about was the healthcare side. It's either or, that's my impression. I don't, you can argue with me and I will turn to you now because the two things is either consumer products or healthcare products aimed at doctors or even aimed at consumers, but having the clinical perspective coming from the hospital care clinical side. That's the impression I got. And Magnus here, here, and, uh, I <laughs> just lost your name completely. Ah, Christina and Magnus, they're both running a company on, on the clinical side. You're an orthopedic and you have App in Med together. And you were here yesterday and I don't think very many of you were here to listen. But you were also at Health 2.0. Please fill in on your impression on the trends. What do you see? Well, we <coughs> actually we were at Health 2.0 last year as well. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, and being there last year, uh, the trend is that it uh, actually was pretty much a lot was the same. Um, so and last year we went there to to see all the Americans uh, that much ahead of us as they should be, right? Because they have a lot of resources. They have have the whole Silicon Valley uh, economic. Uh, backing as well as all the big tech companies that, that uh, we used to have in Sweden but uh, are slowly uh, moving out of the country. So I, For me they should be miles ahead of us. And last year I think they weren't. So the ideas we were seeing there were not so much different from what we, we, what we present here in, in Sweden. I don't know Michael, if, 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 if you th think things have changed. I think we saw more pilots. Last year they presented how cool is it if we do this. This year how cool is it that we actually tested this in 20 patients. So I mean that's a step forward but uh, none of the big breakthroughs were even close as, as far as I saw. But at Health 2.0 the big companies don't come there. So the Google and Apple, are, they're not there. Uh, so for me, it's uh, like a matchmaking. All startups like us uh, want to meet investors. Uh, if they are connected through pilots or whatever, if they're bought up, they're not going to present at 2.0. So I think there is a black box which we don't see. The thing with the division between health sector and, I mean, it's, it's in English, it's Sjukvård and Hälsovård is in Swedish two different things. Uh, in English it's not uh, absolutely the same, so it's di di difficult to, to divide word-wise. But uh, healthcare for the, for the hospitals is different than, than for, the, for the health sector. Uh, I mean, if you would die from not sleeping well enough three d days in a row, you wouldn't have your app out without uh, FDA approval or, or uh, CE marking, etc. So depending, I mean, I discussed with the people from uh, doing pacemakers, and they measure the pulse rate. Same, same uh, things that as, as uh, Fitbit and, and Endomondo do when they, they measure pulse. But I mean, it's a different thing if you look at your app, so, oh, I have max pulse of 157, that's good, I'm improving after cycling. That's a totally different thing than uh, monitoring your pacemaker. Right, so the same same cool gadgets have two different things. Of course, there is di there is different, and that's the th that's the problem in the U.S. I think to get to get on because it's so heavily regulated. Once you s you move into the health real health care, the hospital care. So our conclusion has been maybe stay away a little bit from that for a while, and do more softer things with with. Uh, opinions and, and, and change behavior, uh, like the thing that you don't die. If you don't change your behavior, you won't die immediately. So you can you can work with those things. Uh, 
that was one of your questions. The third question is, um, well, you've been at, at the, the MedEx at Stanford, right? And no, I wasn't. You I wasn't? Was okay, yeah. <laughs> of course, there are a couple of these uh, meetings going on. I was at the South by Southwest, which have a, a MedTech sector a couple of days with the big companies. So there are more uh, represented there. The Google is there and, and Apple are there. So they're more maybe more mega trends, but it's the same uh, medical stuff being discussed there. I thought you were the MedEx at Stanford, which is also more medical, I think. Yeah. Uh, this is more commercial, more health side. Uh, and then I was at Almedal, which was as a Swede was pretty interesting yeah. because that's where the, the political decisions are are not made, but, but discussed. So that was also interesting, uh, uh, the awareness of, of Swedish Swedish politicians do that this is an important uh, topic. Do you have more questions? I may. May? <laughs> yeah. I had the pleasure of listening to you yesterday, and I've also had the pleasure of li listening to you a couple of times before. And I'm thinking, do you think, for instance, Michael in learning to sleep, will will they be in a, uh, what will it change if they were regulatory compliant, if they were medical device certified? Will it change the view, the way healthcare, or you will view such an, uh, such an initiative, for instance, and will that put the company in a different position? Uh, so actually, we are medical yeah. device comp compliant because uh, uh, if you if you have an app and it's not life threatening as um, as you say, uh, you can very easily register it as a medical device uh, digital medi medi medical device class A, which is you just fill in a form on like Med Circuit's uh, homepage, and FDA has the same routine. So. So our, we, we have a web-based product that we are selling in, in Sweden, and that one is both approved by Lackermelsverket and also CE marked. So, so, but I don't, to be honest, I don't know if it has any commercial, <laughs> com commercial value. We have never kind of looked at what if we didn't do it, or but uh, we did it because it was, in that project, we collaborated with one of these big pharma companies, and for them, it was really important. So, um, um, so, but I mean, to to make a mobile application that doesn't measure anything physical. You, if you take a blood blood sample, for instance, then it's another thing because then you're typically a medical device class B, and class B devices then you need to have everything in order and you need to go through the whole validation process at FDA. But as long as you don't do anything physical, uh, my advice to everybody would be that uh, register it as a medical device class A because it's uh, it it is probably. <laughs> a benefit commercially, but but I, ca I can't say it is. So it has been un unregulated. The app word, both in Sweden and in the US, has been more or less uh, unregulated. So so you c you have been able to put any anything out on the market there as, as long as it's not extremely life-threatening or nude pictures in it. Uh, but an app, we, our, all our um, apps are are gone through and are, are revised by Apple now. And some of which we haven't updated for, for two or three years. They are, they are, uh, we get a uh, report from Apple saying you have to take that off market. And also if, if it's medically unsound, it's taken on, they ask you to take it off or they close it down. So they are revising all their apps now. <laughs> and the FDA is also uh, putting some standards up, uh, s telling us what to do, what, what, what we're not allowed to. And some of the, the mental health, health apps are, are actually uh, being asked to remove, get them removed from, from, from the market. So we are moving into the regulated market uh, also uh, for some of the light apps, I think. But I, I agree with Michael. Uh, why don't make it the, r the right way? I think it's going to be some kind of quality mark uh, that you have it CE marked, and then it's a HIPAA compliant in, in, in the US. They talked a lot about the HIPAA compliant, and I think it's just 
you just have to do it like just like when you do a, a clinical study in sweden just get the ethical permission so no no use in fighting against it i would say that depends um yesterday uh, for those of you who were here i told you about um tummy lab now if you're developing a business you're not extremely rich to start with and you're not necessarily extremely dangerous either. So bubbly tummy, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. You've heard about it. Okay, occurs amongst 5% of the Swedish population and increasing. 40% of the Mexican population and increasing. So this is a, a growing problem, but it's nothing you can cure. So you write your own diary for months about all, everything you eat, all ingredients, how you sleep, how you train, toilet visits, everything, and try to find patterns. How do you feel? How do you feel? How do you feel? Try to find patterns, which is extremely difficult. Tommy Lab is an app where you put in exactly the same data, and an algorithm shows you patterns, discoveries. Okay? It's not dangerous, as long as you don't call it IBS. Call it bubbly tummy. And these guys who developed that app, they have a football app, a soccer app, with 4 million users continuously. If they get 4 million users on a bubbly tummy app, they will have loads of data, and they will have earnings making it possible to develop new knowledge about IBS, perhaps new diagnosis, new treatment, new advice, that doctors could use as tools. They would have money to make clinical trials. So I think it's not either or. You need to make revenues on something that is not dangerous, f fully within legal, all kinds of legal aspects. In your case, it's it probably was strategically right and important to even reach the market to have an evidence-based solution. But that was several years ago. Today, it's possible for Tummy Lab to have a solution that is not a medical device, it's not clinically tried, you just use the algorithm put to put in your diary and get discoveries and some support. So I think that's something, it's, it's not black or white, it's an evolution of the business in some cases. In other cases, no way in hell you can sell anything unless you have it clinically tested or some way, because it's, no one will buy it. So I think it differs. Um, if I may, you can sit down, we'll, st we'll keep on discussing. Can I have the picture, please? Where is Martin? So the founder of Health 2.0, who showed me, uh, please interrupt me with questions to these guys and to yourselves and others, whenever you want. Uh, Matthew Holt, the founder of Health 2.0, he made a keynote speech. I didn't see it when he made it, but I see it, saw it when he tried it, and I photographed his pictures. Um, it will come here. It doesn't. It will. Welcome and bienvenue. Welcome, please. Uh, anyway, he, he tried to... There we go. Yes. So this is this first picture. This is what, what it looks like today, how, how we perceive healthcare, how healthcare perceives uh, activities. It's people are healthy, and we don't have to bother a lot, or people are chronically ill, or people are acutely ill. Do you agree that this is the proportions of the activities? Of course. Uh, but the healthcare system treats everything the same way. The whole system is built on one formula. And it's mainly uh, chronically diseased, uh, curing people that are ill. It's very little prevention, for instance. Uh, what he sees for the future is different kinds of solutions for different kinds of parts in this chain. Of course. Now that's what he sees for the future. 
And I would argue that we see this already. Um, we see in the startup, we got some 80 startups of which 50 are high potential from the Nordics. And I'll show a graph of them later. But they're more and more getting into how to monitor chronically ill, to avoid emergency visits, how to give people with bubbly tummy better information to avoid worse disease or acutely ill illness. Uh, and in Sweden alone, McKinsey has made a study saying that if we don't do anything, costs will increase from 450 billion crowns to 710 in 2025. And that's not possible. We won't be able to make that. Uh, but if we do, if we do, we do utilize the opportunities that digitalization will bring, we will reduce that increase by 180 billion by moving in that direction. Do you understand this picture? I, I thought it was rather good. So this is where we spend the money, okay? But if we, if we focus more in that end, more prevention or better handling of chronically ill, we will reduce costs here. And this, this is a bit too late. This is when people are really ill. Like if you have so, COPD, cool. Uh, if you can reduce the number of, what's it called, exacerbation? Exacerbation events at home. If you monitor, what? Re-eruption, that sounds like burps. Is it? It, it is burps. Okay. Something like that, yeah, okay. If you can help the patient at home better, you will have reduced the cost in, the, in, in that end. And of course, better quality for the individual. Um, so, what I notice, and you could please argue with me on this, but in the US, um, costs for healthcare are approaching 20% of the gross national product, gross domestic product. In Sweden, it's 10%. The reason of the difference is it's still too much. We're, we're approaching 10. It's way too much. Uh, we, won't, we won't pay for that in the long run. But anyway, the reason why it's so big there is because it's a completely different system. Uh, the incentives are there to increase healthcare. You get paid for what you do. So clinics want to do more. They get more paid. The insurance companies, however, has an incentive to do something other. We don't have that system here. We have a government-controlled uh, system, mainly, uh, that has the incentive to actually reduce the cost, improve availability, imp improve quality. Uh, it's very fragmented in the US. It's also fragmented here, but compared to the US, the system is much more one body in the Nordics than it is in the US. Uh, they're focusing more and more, as you said yesterday, on health outcome. And, and I think that you, you're, you got the impression that they're actually doing it now. So health outcome, measuring the outcome of what is provided, instead of measuring the events. So you get paid for the results rather than that you did this x-ray, okay? Um, and that is, we talk, about, we talk a lot about it here, but I haven't seen it implemented really here in the Nordics, but I think it will come. Um, there, the development, as I see it, products and companies do it enterprise by enterprise. It's hospital systems doing their development, doing digitalization, with their own data and their own solutions, or insurance companies doing their own systems. When we do it here, we can do it actually for quite a wide market. It's not as big as the US, but it's still more one body. Um, new solutions are either clinical, with a clinical perspective, and I'll give an example, and business to business. So the startups are either clinical business to business solutions to that market or consumer perspective business to consumer. 
That's my impression. Um, now, I saw Eva, Eva Care. Do you know Eva Care? They have a smart plug to monitor elderly. Now, when they say that, everyone says, everyone has a smart plug to monitor elderly. And it's been difficult for them to distinguish themselves amongst others. But then I saw them on a panel. Did, were you on that panel? Five companies demoed their products for elderly, monitoring of elderly or taking care of elderly with digital solutions. And this was the only one actually desirable for someone like me. It, the whole approach, the design, everything is for seniors. For seniors, 60 or so plus, to avoid being hospitalized, to lead a better life, a healthier life, and to you know, be monitored in ways that they need, but still they don't feel like elderly. Whilst the other solutions were, so we got this web browser, here you log in, you log in as an administrator, and then you put in this data and this, it was horrible, sheets. That was the product. And it was all from the clinical perspective. You fill in data that the clinics want, okay? But Ava Home has both, Ava Care. They have the user perspective, the family perspective, and the uh, elderly care perspective. So that's the difference, they have both. And I noticed that uh, the products that we have in the Nordics, they do have both, more user design, multiple user design, instead of either or. Um, yeah. That's what I wanted to say. So, our products, the startups in the Nordics, some are here, some are the primary care, elderly care, hospital care, and this is, this is a spreadsheet of the 50 that we normally talk about, and, and Edith, there you are. You wondered yesterday. So, healthcare here, consumers here, quite many, products are platform-like. Uh, they, they solve things in this angle. These are platforms, these are specific products. Where the consumer is involved and the healthcare or the primary care or the elderly care. And the design is for all the ingredients or all the actors here. Uh, your product is here, consumers. Uh, and there you compete with a hell of a lot of Americans, and you were still picked. Amazing. So what I saw is this. This is what the American startups do. Either or. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But if we're going to change, the paradigm shift is going to require this. Questions? More questions, dialogue? In what did you think about the Nordic Innovation House that actually hosted uh, our visit there? And you visited them, and we're part of them. Yeah. So Nordic Innovation House, have you heard about it? It's the Nordics. It's Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Iceland that have joined forces. They used to be one each, and Sweden had none. Then Anne Lidgard from Vinova was appointed to be in charge of Sweden in Silicon Valley, the innovation director. Uh, but she decided, I can't do this alone, so she teamed up with the others. And they have uh, a joint office space, uh, Nordic Innovation House, and they run programs like they have Tink, which was the Norwegian acceleration program for tech startups. Very good, now invites Swedish companies, Danish and Finnish too and Icelandic, and they offer office, or you could have a post box there, uh, you could officially be in Silicon Valley on Ramona Street in Palo Alto at $110 per month. That's right, and you have that. Is that something you benefit from? Are we selling Nordic Innovation House now? Uh, no, but I just wanted to, to hear your, because we've been there as, as a desk uh, company for two years, uh, because, uh, we go there to 
because we worked with Stanford University, which is uh, two blocks away. Uh, so of course we wanted to have our company there. Uh, and we go there a couple of times a year to f to feel what's going on in, in, in the valley. Uh, and you get some update there. But, I mean, we're there two or three times a year. You can actually sit there if you want to to launch in the US you could you could use that connection and have a sit sit seat there have other people doing the same thing for a couple of months or a couple of weeks whatever uh, but i don't know if it's working what did other companies uh, say about it well most companies that i've talked to find it very useful really yeah I would like to add some things about that office and what you can make out of that or other offices. But you have a question? Yeah, well, actually, no, I've got another question now that you say that. Because now we talk a lot about the U.S. as being kind of a, a different market than the one where we are kind of developing on and, and starting up our businesses in. But what about the rest of the European market? That's my first question. And then I had another question. But let's take that one. Anyone that can answer that? So we've had limited resources, and I'll, I'll answer why we went to Health 2.0. Because in Silicon Valley, that's our main competitor region globally. Once that they find something interested, they run like, they run so fast. And this, this train we were onto a couple of years ago already, and they were not. But by being there, we know the fastest how they run because they do have the financial muscles as we, we don't have it like that. We have muscles, but they're not entrepreneurial enough, uh, the, the funding. <laughs> uh, so this is just, that, that's where it works faster. If we can be as fast as them, we can compete. What is happening in India, Africa, China, or all over Asia, South America, Frankly, I don't know. Does anyone know? Yeah. So, but I will start in Europe because, yeah. So, uh, look, for, first of all, uh, India, Africa, Brazil, whatever you're here, if you don't have really something that is the best innovation in the world and you speak fluent Portuguese if you want to go to Brazil, I mean, forget about it because it's too difficult. Or if you find a fantastic partner that will help you and do a joint venture in those markets, but the European market is, of course, if if of course of course brilliant. But just to emphasize what Marianne is saying about the U.S. and and why they are going to the U.S. That is that if you want to go with your product out in Europe, like we are doing that now, we are launching in Germany next year and in France and maybe actually in Russia as well, and we can do it just because we have launched in the US. Because typically the first thing a German partner asks you, if you are in Berlin talking with somebody that can help you into the, into the German market, they say, okay, have you launched in, in the US yet? Because the US is kind of a quality stamp. So, so, so even though it's a big jump to go to the US, and it sounds crazy to go to the US first, just in order to get into Germany, it will help you to be in the US. Even if it is only, like for, for us, an office address in Palo Alto. Because that also matters. I mean, uh, we also have an office at the Nordic Innovation House. And a fantastic thing about that is when you are emailing US investors, half of them reply saying, oh, great address in Palo Alto, by the way. <laughs> So people actually notice that you have an office space in Palo Alto, even if it's just a desk that you share with 200 other people. They don't know, right? Yeah, and they just see Ramona Street. And Ramona Street is a fantastic street in, in the middle of Palo Alto, uh, just University Avenue. So I mean, it's, it, it is a fantastic address. So, so, and they notice that. So, so that's why I think that it makes sense to, do, to go to the U.S., but f for us, the U.S. is just kind of the entry ticket into Germany. So if you look at the European market, I would say that Germany is an interesting market if you, of course, have the funds and uh, uh, 
the way to translate things into German because you need to do that. You can't sell uh, products in English in Germany. That's impossible. So you need to translate it into German. But if you can do that, Germany is the biggest country in Europe, 86 million people. And if you compare what we do here to what they do in Germany, I have talked to a lot of startups in Ber Berlin in digital health. I mean, we are we are we are way far. Uh, the, the German digital health company, most of them are far behind us. So we have a very big competitive advantage in Germany, but we need that quality stamp saying that we have been in the US, and it sounds crazy, but that's the way it is. I heard. Uh, so I, I, I want to add on to Europe. Uh, I think it's two different things. The consumer market, which in the long run will be tools available at $7 per year. There will be apps based on artificial intelligence that will provide you with earlier diagnosis, etc., uh, throughout the world. And that will be on the internet with practically no boundaries. Then th we talk about the healthcare side. Europe is moving, but the Nordics is moving faster, I would say. Denmark and Finland are pretty advanced already. Well, advanced. I mean, this technology was available 20 years ago, but they've been doing telehealth for some while and video uh, visits, etc. We talk about it here today as if it was completely new. Uh, in Finland, uh, nurses are already in hospitals scanning uh, the barcode of your bracelet, <laughs> which you get when you enter. They're scanning that with whatever mobile phone. And they retrieve all the data available on that patient. And then they put in new data manually from different monitors. They reduced the errors by 75%. And they reduced a lot of administ administrative work. So a lot of time is, is saved. Now this is to industry, other kinds of industry. This would have happened many years ago. Uh, but in Finland, they're doing that now. But those startups, they need the Nordic Corporation to scale because they're not used to scaling internationally. But Finland is pretty far. England, U the UK, is pretty far. The national health system, NHS, yeah? Uh, they're pretty advanced when it comes to innovation procurement. And also, in some areas in England, they're pretty advanced when it comes to what I would call population health, involving the patients in, and bringing in new solutions. Implementation hasn't been that successful yet, though. And the partners that we have in, in Nordic Star Trek do have connections, strong connections. So Salganska Science Park is, is working heavily with UK. Uh, Oslo MedTech is working heavily with Boston and Minnesota, and India, actually. And their report from their last visit to India was that there are a number of hospitals that really would like to purchase international technology. The things that we may be able to develop here with the connectivity centers and, and cloud computing and artificial intelligence here, uh, maybe. Changes. This is a paradigm shift. And there are always, um, I'm very cynical here, there are always four out of a hundred. And those are the only four that ever moves. The other, there are another four that understands what those four are talking about and will follow them. But the other 92 won't do anything until it has happened because they can't see it. You and you and some others are a few of those doctors that see this, that try to do things. So it's not you we have to push, it's your colleagues. Okay, and we're doing that in, in Region Skåne. I'm not saying you should wait for Region Skåne, I'm just saying that things are starting to happen, but don't trust me on that yet. <laughs> No, I mean, you need to have customers. Find customers. Could be private customers, could be public customers, wherever. But try to find customers. Find a business that will pay your bills. And then you can develop the business further on. <laughs>